Hi, I'm James Walden, the Planning Director for the City of Conway. One of the questions that we frequently get asked about is, what do you think about Conway's future? How are we going to grow? How are we going to develop? Uh, so the point of this presentation, it's one that I often give to a lot of community groups in, in talking about that, is to sort of address that question in particular. Uh, one of the things that we'll cover through this is looking at what's behind us, so the history of Conway. You might think that's kind of a strange way of thinking about how we answer the future of the city, but really to understand how Conway has developed and where Conway will go in the future, we have to talk about what was, came in the past. Uh, so we'll talk about Conway's history, we'll talk about why Conway built the way that it did, and then we'll also look at where we're heading in the future. This is one of my favorite images uh, of, our, of our city. Um, this is the old uh, depot that you see there along the railroad, right along Front Street in downtown, uh, where Simon Park is. On the left, you see the freight depot. Uh, I mean, on the left, you see the passenger depot, and then on the right, you see the freight depot. Uh, both of those were demolished some, some years ago, but it was sort of a significant part of the, the history of our town as well. So when we go to the history of Conway, we have to go all the way back to 1871, when Conway Station was established. Conway is a railroad town, just like many of the other towns in our, in our region, such as Moralton or Russellville or Benton and Bryant. So many of the, the towns in our area were founded and created around the same time, and that's because that the railroad was built at that time. And so the railroad, uh, back then they used these steam engines, and so one of the things that was really uh, important on that was that they have water stops. And so every few miles or so, that's why they platted towns. That's why there's the distance between us and Moralton and the distance and, and those sorts of things that, that go along with it. Uh, this was also a sort of a, a money-making mechanism for the railroads at that time. Uh, when they were granted these wide swaths of land uh, to develop the railroad, one of the things that they did was they platted towns to make money. And so Conway is one of those towns that got platted uh, and created to be a water stop and make money for uh, the railroad company. Uh, so we were platted in 1871, we officially got a post office in 1872, we officially became a, a city in 1875. Uh, and that's sort of the, the very founding and starting of our, the history of our community. One of the things through this presentation you'll see are some population figures that kind of show and tell a story of the history of Conway as well as we're going along. So we've got there Conway compared to Rogers, Russellville, Blytheville, and the Benton Bryant area. I, I, I've combined Benton and Bryant together since they are in very much ways a very similar one cohesive community today. Uh, and this will help tell the story of some of these changes that I talk about here. Um, so on this, on this slide here you see images uh, the first image that you see there, that is looking from uh, where the Arnold Innovation Center is or the, the old Conway City Hall, looking towards the east down Oak Street. Uh, so on the left, that would be the uh, Toad Suck Square building, and on the right, uh, that building got replaced by the Halter building uh, later on. And then the plat that you see on the very right is the original plat for the, for the town of Conway. One of the things that's interesting on this plat is that what you don't see is Front Street. Um, so originally all the traffic in the main part of downtown was meant to travel along the railroad. Uh, now obviously that is not a, a workable long-term solution. Uh, probably one of those things that was, was sort of an oversight for our railroad engineer, Mr. Mr. Robinson, that, that was our town creator. Uh, but it is a very interesting part of our, our history there. So you look at the census figures from 1880. Uh, and Conway by that time, in that period of nine years, had already grown to over a thousand people. Uh, and so that, I think that's a, quite a bit of rapid growth. People were moving here in droves. They were creating businesses. They saw this as a place of opportunity. Uh, and it, it was particularly a place of opportunity uh, related to agriculture. Uh, agriculture was very big for our, our community early on. Uh, you compare that to Rogers. Rogers didn't yet exist. Russellville had about 514 folks at that time. It, again, is a similar railroad community that was founded. Blytheville, Blytheville, up in the northeast corner of our state, didn't exist yet at this time. And then Benton and Bryant had about 452 people. And that's really just Benton at that time. Benton was incorporated back in 1836. So moving forward, some context and some information I think is important to understand sort of where we're at at this time in, in history across the U.S. 
uh, we were still very much in the throes of the Industrial Revolution at this time. So if you can imagine, um, factories are building everywhere. They're going into cities. People are moving from the country to the city in droves. I mean, it, uh, I think in a one 10 year period for Chicago in the late 1800s, they grew by half a million people, which is just simply amazing. And it's because of industrial revolution. Uh, and one of the things that cities started to get this really nasty reputation, because if you can imagine uh, the transportation situation at that time is, it was wherever your feet could take you. That's how far and how big the city ended up getting built. So you had to walk to work, you had to walk to where you shopped, you had to do all those things by foot. Uh, and you had a lot of nasty uh, industrial uses at that time, uh, tanneries that used uh, waste matter to help uh, tan hides and things like that. So you can imagine sort of the disgusting smells that, that industries brought and people had to live next to those things. Uh, cities really got a bad reputation, nasty and dirty. Uh, this is juxtaposed to the World's Fair, that the, the Columbian Exposition that happened in Chicago in 1893. And that's the image that you see on the, the screen there. So you can imagine uh, maybe perhaps living in Cleveland or New York uh, next to a factory that had fetid smells all of the time. Uh, and you've got waste in the streets. There's no sewer. You have dirty water. People are dying. Uh, and then you come to this World's Fair and you see these beautiful uh, walkways and these beautiful uh, landscaped areas. And you just imagine if we can do this for a World Fair, why can't we build our cities in this manner? And so a lot of people started to ask that question, and it spurred uh, what we call the City Beautiful Movement, which gave rise to city planning as we know it today. Uh, one interesting fact about this uh, with that, that Columbian Exposition is the majority of the buildings that were constructed, they were actually temporary. So they built these beautiful ornate structures out of this material called staff. Uh, and it was really just equivalent to kind of like a heavy paper mache. Uh, they actually ended up burning a lot of them uh, a year or so after the, the World's Fair, uh, which is, I think, a pretty interesting uh, and neat part of that, that story. So that's some of the sort of the context of the way that we're thinking about things. Late 1800s, reform movement's big. Uh, people start that, that City Beautiful movement. They want to improve cities. They want to be better. People are founding new towns. We're in sort of this an expansionist mode. Everybody wants to be the new great grand community. Uh, and Conway was no exception at that time. And really, in a lot of ways, we were exceptional. Uh, we wanted to be an Athens uh, in a lot of ways. Athens in a sense of being sort of this educational focal point uh, within our state. Uh, and so our city leaders at that time said, we want education to be a major driver for our community, for it to be a, sort of a source of improvement. So one of the first and foremost things was we, we attracted Central College. It was established in 1892. That now today is Central Bible College or Central Baptist College. Um, Hendricks moved to Conway in 1890. Uh, so it was before it was the uh, Hendricks Henderson College. that was in Altus. It moved here. Uh, and then 1908, uh, in what arguably has to be the best investment in Conway's history, probably statewide, we got the Arkansas State Normal School in 1908. Uh, that now is known as uh, University of Central Arkansas. So that huge, large university that is a tremendous asset for our community, tremendous economic driver for our community. Uh, for us as a local community, it only costs $51,000. $753, uh, an immense, immense value for all of the benefits that it has reaped uh, in the years since then. So what you see from this story very early on is sort of this, this exceptionalism of Conway, this idea that we wanted to be better, we wanted to be a better community, and we were very progressive in sort of the moves that we made to attract colleges. Those, things, those are things that we continue to reap the benefits of today. When you look at sort of the growth that happened from that early period in 1880 to 1900, you see Conway has doubled in population to about 2,000 people. Rogers also was created and it grew very rapidly as well. Uh, Russellville up until this time is still keeping up with the population growth in Conway. Uh, Blytheville you see is a, a town that just got founded at that time that had 302 people and Benton and Bryant are at about 1,100 people. Now, one of the things, interesting things that you see with Blytheville, uh, a lot of people associate the, uh, that northeast part of the state as being 
uh, sort of a, a legacy agricultural area. Actually, in that very part of, of uh, sort of East Mississippi County, it was heavily forested up until about the 1880s when those, those uh, towns were created. Uh, ironically, when I talked about Chicago, the great fire that happened up there in the late 1800s, the conflagration fire that burned blocks and blocks and blocks and blocks and blocks of the city destroyed a lot of it. Uh, much of Chicago was rebuilt from the wood that came from Northeast Arkansas, the forests. And then after that, the rich soils that existed uh, in the soil of those, those forests actually got turned to agriculture. Uh, and that's really one of the areas where Blytheville started to grow was because of that agriculture boom uh, that occurred up there. So that's our history from 1880s to 1910s. Uh, the image that you see on the slide there, that kind of conveys uh, sort of the extent of where Conway had grown in, the, in that era. Uh, it's all very much focused around downtown. Again, uh, you know, the, the personal automobile is not really a big thing at this time. Uh, and so people, again, have to walk. So everything is as compact as possible. Uh, people either live and interact with downtown on a daily basis, have to walk everywhere, or they're coming in from places like the Little Plantation on the weekend to, to you know, sell their goods, uh, to bring their, their crops to market and things like that and buy the stuff that they might need or just socialize and have fun and have a good time. Uh, coming to town, that, that phrase where you say, I'm gonna go to town, that's, that's really where that comes from, where people literally just went into town uh, once a week or a couple times, a, or once every few weeks. The types of buildings and houses that you saw at this time, are these are so, sort of some of the examples that you have down there below. Uh, on the left, that's a craftsman style home that, that started to be, start to become uh, more of a thing in this, this period. You've got American Foursquare in the middle. That was very popular during this period. Uh, and then you see the, the halter building there on the right. Uh, that was a very modern office building that was constructed. I think it might have been constructed a little after this, this period, um, but it was one of those replacement buildings that you started to see happen downtown as the city was just growing and growing and growing. So in the next 10 years, by, by 1910, Conway's at about 2,800, so is Rogers. Russellville is actually at that time larger than Conway, uh, believe it or not. And when I talked about that agricultural boom, agricultural boom that occurred in Blytheville, you see that, that that started to happen. People were moving to Blytheville like nothing else. Uh, there was about 3,800 folks up there. Uh, Benton and Bryant are still a little bit smaller at this period. So 1910s, a little bit more about 1910s. This is also when zoning was created. So I talked about the social reform movement, the city beautiful movement that, that created people having to live next to these fetid factories and, and horrible smells and sewers and, and all of those sorts of things. And so in 1916, uh, the city of New York adopted the first uh, uniform zoning uh, ordinance for the, the entirety of New York. Uh, and it really was related to the development of, of one building in particular. Uh, it was a large, very large skyscraper that got built, and it was built straight up, which obviously most skyscra skyscrapers are. Uh, but it was constructed in a way that folks that were down at ground level uh, surrounding this building never saw daylight. And so part of the, the sort of the idea behind these regulations is that buildings would be tiered as they go up. So when you look, think about Empire State Building, the Chrysler Building, those types of structures, they're a result of that uh, early on zoning code. Uh, this is also the creation of NIMBY, uh, happened at that time, not in my backyard, um, popular phrase. Uh, I think this, this image that th is there on the right, uh, sort of from the, the City of Seattle Zoning Commission is, is fairly funny. Uh, because that's, that's one of the common things that you hear in planning is, would you want to live next, next door to this? And so uh, this was saying that zoning would, would help uh, prevent this particular problem. The irony of that is that's a cottage style uh, housing development with tiny homes. That's actually something folks are wanting to move back to today. And so the, that's the, sort of the, the irony of that. The bigger joke of this is uh, insomnia. We, we found a, an effective cure for insomnia at that, that time. Uh, when zoning was created. Uh, we in the planning department, we love zoning codes. We love reading zoning codes. We love applying zoning codes. It's something that we're passionate about, but we know uh, just about 99.9% .9 of the remainder of the population finds it as boring as can be. And uh, we understand that. 
So if you ever have sort of trouble falling asleep or anything like that, just go to conwayarkansas.gov, go to the planning and development page, and go to plans and regulations and start reading the zoning code. Five or ten minutes, you'll be right out. So, uh. so we progress to the 1920s and 1930s, and again, we start to see sort of these progressive moves uh, that happen within Conway. Um, we start getting to the, the end of the, the 20s going into the 30s and uh, economic fortunes across our nation as the, as the sort of the advent of the Great Depression comes along, things aren't looking so great, right? Uh, and Hendricks College is, is worried about shutting down at this time. Uh, and so in a really, really ingenious move that again, we still are reaping the benefits from today, uh, Conway Corporation was created and it was done by folks that you hear you have streets named after today, the Ferris or Robbins and, and Clark. Uh, those were sort of very progressive city leaders at that time that came up with this inventive solution to take the municipally owned utility and take it to continuing to be a municipally owned utility, but somehow create devise this sort of nonprofit corporation to operate it to generate revenue to give to education in sort of a philanthropic way to save Hendricks College. So we, we went from having a municipally owned and operated utility to having a municipally owned utility, still preserving the interests of the community in that way, but having this sort of innovative structure. And that move at that time has allowed us to stay on the front edge and the front curve of so many things that have come along with broadband, with cable, with other sort of uh, advents in, in telecommunications that it, it, in, in reliable power sources. Uh, ask anybody that, that might be on other utility uh, companies and they say, wow, it's so much cheaper on Conway Corp. Wow, the, you know, the, the uh, customer service and the, the downtime with Conway Corp is just so much better. It's so much greater. Uh, and that's, that's a sort of a legacy that I think we all get to enjoy uh, as Conway residents. And it's important to think, to remember that these are intentional moves. These are moves that have, that were taken place occurred that addressed specific things at that time, but that people were looking 40, 50, 60 years down the line, they said, this is going to be important for our community. This is going to be something that makes us a great place to live. Uh, and it's not just a given that those sorts of decisions happen. Uh, and I don't mean any offense to, to any folks that are from Moralton or, or grew up in Moralton. Uh, but in many of the same ways, Moralton at that time had a lot of the same dreams, hopes that Conway did. Uh, in 1926, the six-story building in downtown Moralton was constructed to house a, a very large bank building. At that time, Moralton was a relatively similar size to Conway. Harding College also was, was at Moralton at that time. Um, uh, but, you know, with, with bad economic fortunes, uh, the town unfortunately lost the college in 1932 ended up moving to Searcy, and it has had a major uh, detrimental impact on that community for decades and decades and decades. Additionally, one of the things that you see that is sort of a big change in this time in the 1920s and the 1930s is that cars start to be a big deal. Car ownership starts to, to there's more and more folks that start to own them, uh, and so it ends up changing the city form. It ends up being one of those things that, uh, whereas people were walking to where they had to go previously, this enables them to live further out and it enables them to drive to be sort of as, as a mode of personal convenience. Uh, and so there's a lot of really wonderful things that come with that, a lot of freedom and a lot of mobility that come with that, but it also has changed our city form in a lot of very interesting uh, and unique different ways. So by 1930, uh, you look at these population figures, Conway is it up at about uh, 5,500. Rogers is still a smaller community. Uh, Blytheville. Blytheville grew in an immense amount. Again, that agricultural boom that was occurring at this time, a lot of labor was needed for that, for that intensive type style of agriculture that was going on up in northeast Arkansas. A lot of labor and a lot of folks moved in. Uh, additionally, I'm not sure exactly when, but Eaker Air Force Base uh, went up in there as well, uh, was established, and that was a major sort of hub. Uh, and then you look at uh, Russellville. Russellville's at the same population level as, as Conway and then Benton and Bryant there as well. 1940s and 1950s. Again, we look at this and we see 
another progressive move that has occurred by the city, the city's leadership, and sort of the, the folks at large. We start talking about industrialization in our community. And within Arkansas, we were, whereas industrialization really happened in large cities up north and places like Birmingham in a, in a, in a large way, uh, much earlier on, it really didn't happen in smaller communities like Conway until much later. Uh, and so where, where some cities were talking about agriculture boom and focusing on that as sort of their major economic engine, that started to wane within Conway locally. Uh, and so well, we looked at sort of how can we attract industry at that time. In, in International Shoe comes in in 1946. Verco comes in in 1954. The Conway Development Corporation is founded in 1959. And the Federal Highway Act of 1956 that was responsible for building a lot of freeways throughout our entire nation uh, is passed at that time. And I-40, we become a location where I-40 is going to locate. That has a significant impact on our community. So looking at some of the form of, of development that happened at that time, this is sort of a typical house that you see on the, that uh, screen. Um, in contrast to some of the types of houses that were built before that period, they tend to be smaller. Home ownership ends up being a thing that is more common. GIs come back uh, from World War II. Uh, there's a lot of federal funding and backing uh, into home ownership, and it becomes sort of this almost universal dream for almost every family to own a home. Uh, however small it might be, however modest it might be, that is sort of a dream for, uh, for so many folks. And so you see these, these small houses that are 800 to you know, up to 1,300 square feet become very, very common. Uh, in development. Again, 1950, you see a ton of uh, continuing growth in Blytheville. Uh, it continues to be driven by, by agriculture. Uh, Russellville and Conway are, are very similar level with about 8,600, 8,000 8, folks. Rogers is, seems to be stagnating a little bit at that time. Benton and Bryant uh, have started to grow. Uh, and that, I think, has some relationship to the Federal Highway Act of 1956. One of the first sections of interstate built in Arkansas was actually called the New Benton Freeway, uh, which is now I-30 that connected Little Rock to, to the Benton area, as well as there was some freeway up in northeast, Ar northeast Arkansas. So in the 1950s, we head to the 1950s and 1960s, uh, and, and we see some big changes start to occur in our community. Uh, planning comes into the state of Arkansas in a big way in 1957. Uh, ironically, it... it uh, isn't it comes because of nothing related to city planning at all. Uh, Little Rock Air Force Base, the federal government says we're, we want to locate an Air Force Base in, in uh, the Jacksonville area, but they say, hey, we, you've got to be able to control land use, and if you don't do that, we're not going to, if you don't have uh, planning in the state or land use controls, we're not coming. And so Compliantly, the uh, state legislature said, yes, we will, we will pass a uh, planning uh, statutes to do that. Uh, and so that enabled a lot of cities to start doing this planning thing. Again, in a very progressive move, what does Conway do? We say, yep, yeah, we're at the first of the line. Uh, let's get our planning commission created and established. Uh, so they do that in 1955. Um, we adopt a zoning ordinance in 1957. Uh, we end up um, doing a planning study a little bit later with 1959, which that image in the the bottom left there, that's sort of a, one of the, the things that comes out of that planning study. It's a very, very interesting document uh, to read through and, and look at all of the information. Uh, it's very interesting with that, uh, you know, going all the way back to, to then, sort of the, the awkwardness of uh, whether Oak Street or Prince Street and Caldwell, whether that's going to be the major corridor through town uh, was addressed back then. And, and I think that's really one of the reasons why roundabouts work so well here is because of that, that Western and Prince intersection and, and that solution that we found that works pretty well there. Uh, the image below, that's the 6465 motel. Uh, that's sort of an image of the type of commercial development that was occurring at this time. Uh, and another huge uh, uh, event that occurs is the, the development of the Conway Industrial Park. So in the southeast part of town right there at the Dave Ward Interchange, uh, that develops, that's going to drive a lot of our continuing industrialization, one of the major pegs of, of growth. So early on in our community, it, it, you know, I could say that um, agriculture and education 
Uh, those were sort of the, some of the major drivers. When we start to industrialize in the 1940s, that becomes sort of a, a three-legged stand. Uh, and that's something that I think is very important for our growth. It made us stable in a lot of ways that we had different avenues and ways that we could grow. Looking at, at population figures at this time, we start to put a little distance between ourselves and, and Russellville. We've got almost 10,000 folks by 1960. Uh, Russellville's got about 8,900. Rogers has still not grown quite a lot. And Blytheville, you can see Blytheville has really taken off. They, they continue to grow at a very fast clip. And then Benton and Bryant, uh, they start to see the effects of suburbanization uh, in the manner that they've grown. They, they uh, pass uh, Conway in a big way uh, with a lot of the, the suburban growth that, that occurs as a result of the construction of the freeway at that time. 50s and 60s, um, lots of crazy stuff starts to happen. Weird things happen. So cars really start to dominate the city. Our street patterns change. Uh, you know, if you go back and you look at our, our grid system uh, in some of those previous images of, of downtown Conway, you see streets like Robinson and Prince and Caldwell and, and Oak and uh, all of these different streets that go straight and they keep going straight and they keep going straight um, and sort of in a city planner's dream and, and idea, they would have gone straight forever. We would have just had this perfect uh, grid system where, where streets would have continued to be laid out in a, in a straight manner. But the sort of the MO and the idea at that time was we really like curvilinear streets. So uh, one of those early subdivisions that was developed there, it's uh, near Robinson and, and Ferris. Uh, they take Robinson and they turn it down and, and so it, it no longer goes straight and then it ends up deading, dead ending into Ferris at that location. Uh, which I think today is probably one of those things that we probably wouldn't do today, but it uh, was a very interesting choice that was made. Uh, in addition in this period, sidewalks really become uh, less important. We really stop building them. Up until this point, uh, cities uh, you know, made a major effort to build sidewalks because people walked a lot. They had to walk to get places. It still was pretty common 50s and 60s for not everybody to have a car. Uh, and so folks would have to hitch a ride to go to the grocery store and, and things like that. Um, but we start to see, you know, that that transition out. Uh, and then we also see the rise of the strip center or, or what we call the commercial development uh, strip center. One of the very earliest places that developed uh, at this time was Faulkner, Faulkner Plaza. And so, which is where uh, Hobby Lobby is, uh, if, you, if you go out that way uh, and visit that. It, one thing that you'll note about that development is a very, very large parking lot. In what happened a lot at this time were what we call these seas of asphalt. Uh, so development, we didn't really think about, well, what are the effects of putting tons of asphalt down and how does that affect drainage? That re really wasn't one of the things that we considered at that time. Uh, how do these become sort of these heat islands that, that kind of become these oppressive places? Uh, we didn't think about that. We didn't think really about how you get from the car to the building. Those weren't really considerations that were, were large at the time because this was a new and innovative style of development. This was the new thing. And so where you see that sea of parking, that was the MO. That was what everybody was doing. That was the best thing to do. So I kind of call this a little bit of a crazy period. You can see there. It wasn't just in the way that we developed cities. Fashion was interesting, let's just say. Hairstyles were something else. <laughs> so the, um, I've, I've in presentations before, I've said, well, you know, people started doing some, some crimes against humanity with hair, uh, but uh, very interesting hairstyles, just to say the, the least with that. Uh, so we look at 1970s, and this is really when Conway starts to find the gas pedal. This is when growth starts to be a big thing. Uh, by this time, Conway has connected up to I-40. Uh, and so we see more of the same style of development. We see that uh, a lot of single family development. You start to see franchises, places like McDonald's and Burger King's and all those things. Those start to be sort of regular amenities that you see in places like Conway. Oak Street and Hark Rider, that's sort of the locus of where all our commercial development is going. Everything is developing. You see single family neighborhoods like Smoking Oaks and Tucker Creek subdivision. We've got some very interesting housing styles that develop at that time, which are some of the ones that you can see in those subdivisions that I, that I mentioned. And our growth really is happening and occurring 
to the northwest. Uh, that's really where we seem to be going in a big way at this time. It's probably because of utilities and, and folks owning land there that it's easily accessible. One of the things that I think is, is very interesting about this is by this period of the 1970s, there are areas within Conway where the eastern city limits at that time are still today the eastern city limits of the city. So that, I think that's very interesting because we just haven't had a lot of growth happen in East Conway over time, at least not from a residential standpoint. So when I say we start to find the gas pedal, Conway jumps over 15,000. And you see sort of that, that effect that start to have that effect of suburbanization. So that leg uh, that I talked about, the three-legged stool of industry and agriculture and uh, education, that leg of agriculture is replaced by suburbanization. Now, we are definitely not a suburb uh, of Little Rock. When you look at the statistical figures, there are more people that commute into Conway than commute out of Conway. But that suburbanization story is part of sort of the component, it is one of the things that we are in part, partially, there are a lot of folks that work in, Con uh, li work in Little Rock that live here. Uh, but we are not a suburb uh, in a proper sense. We're more of an edge city. Uh, so Conway's hit 15,000 people. Blytheville, you know, they hit a peak. Uh, they're continuing to grow, uh, seeing a lot of the benefits of the development of the Air Force Base and all of the employment that that brings in. Benton and Bryant booming at that time. Uh, they, for all the growth that's happening in Conway, they're still seeing a ton of it in, down in Benton and Bryant. It happens to be a little bit closer to Little Rock. We put distance between us, a, a big fair amount of distance between us and, and Russellville by this time. And you see Rogers is still somewhat of a, a, a smaller community as well. So the 1980s and 1990s, I would call this for Conway the era of West Conway. This is when so much of the development of West Conway occurred. By 18, 1989, we had annexed almost all the way to the river. Uh, some of the, the neighborhoods that developed at this time were Shady Valley, Mallard's Crossing, Sherman Oaks. Um, Mr. Crafton, who, who's developed a lot of subdivisions in Conway, he's developed some of those. Uh, and so he, he starts to become very active at that time. One of the things that's, that's noted is we are severely underserved for retail. Uh, we, we finally get a super center, uh, the, what we call the old super center up on Skyline in 1992. Uh, but just imagine that that was our, the only and major retail hub that we had at that time. So we had 26,000 people, uh, you know, a little bit less than half of the population that we currently have, and how much less retail we had because that was, that was sort of the focal point. I think it's, it's sort of amazing to think about and, and um, reflect on just how much commercial development has happened and how much that has made us a destination and made us less reliant on other communities for commercial shopping as well. Um, this period also is when we get our reputation for bad traffic. And honestly, it was a well-deserved reputation. We grew in a very big way. Traffic got very bad. And so we start thinking about things like the development of Dave Ward Drive. We start thinking about things like the Western Arterial, Arterial Loop, which was uh, proposed on one of our comprehensive plans. Uh, we did our first comprehensive plan uh, since the 1970s uh, for the city in 1991. We redid our zoning ordinance in 1994, which is the base document that we still operate off of today. And then Five years later, after the first that, that comprehensive plan in 1991, we went back to the drawing board in 1996 again because we were growing so much. So planning really starts to be a thing. And this is another example of the way in which we were starting to be progressive at that time. We knew we had to get ahead of these planning issues at that time when we were growing because if we didn't, we could end up with a lot of things that would be big mistakes and big problems that we would have to fix later on. By 1990, we have 26,000 folks. Uh, you see Rogers start to grow a lot. Blytheville starts to, to suffer some. And a, a large component of that is that, that you start to see is one of the things that starts occurring is the closure of the Air Force Base. Uh, additionally, all of the labor that was needed for intensive agriculture uh, starts to go away. That, that is no longer necessary because of mechanization. Uh, Blytheville was a little bit slow to the game in terms of industrialization, and so they have a rough period of transition that, that starts to begin there. Uh, Russellville has grown a lot in this period as well. Uh, they see a lot of industrial growth too. Uh, and then you see that we have passed Benton and Bryant by this time. 
Uh, and part of, I think, the story with that is sort of the, the amenity and the quality of development and sort of the style and the intentionality that we approach things uh, in Conway starts to make us a sort of distinctive, attractive location within all of central Arkansas, the most attractive community to move to. Um, by the 2000s, uh, Conway does the blow up. They, we blow up at that period. Uh, so we go from 26,000 people in 1990 to by 2000, we have 43,000 folks. A tremendous amount of uh, development, a tremendous amount of growth that happens. And we also start to hit the gas pedal on uh, planning. Uh, that becomes uh, an absolute, the red alarm, red alarm critical alerts are going off. We've got to address all these things that are related to development that are happening. We've got to, we've got to deal with this. So the Dave Ward Access Management Plan uh, is developed in 2000 with the advent of the improvement of Dave, the current uh, configuration of Dave Ward Drive. Uh, we develop uh, zoning overlays for Dave Ward, Print Street, and Hogan. Uh, that those were sort of, we wanted to enhance the way that development occurred in those areas. And so we said, we're going to have special regulations for these areas. Today, we've just adopted many of the things that were included in those and, and adopted them citywide. So they became test cases for what we did. Uh, we adopted a new subdivision ordinance that same year. So imagine how busy, the I, I just imagine how busy the planning department was at that time. It had to have been uh, something else. Uh, site plan review becomes a thing that we, we start doing in 2002. Site plan review relates to when a, someone brings in a commercial or multifamily development, dictating where the parking goes, landscaping, drainage, all of those sorts of things. 2003, uh, the impact fees are a big part of the story. That's when we adopt impact fees. Uh, and that, that, for a long period of time, has been something that was somewhat of a, a co controversial uh, discussion within our community, impact fees. But it was a very necessary step to deal with the, the uh, growth that was occurring in the, at that time. Sort of the idea behind impact fees is that when a new house develops or a new commercial development uh, occurs, they pay a proportional rate, a proportional fee that then goes to pay for streets and parks, things like that, that pays for the impact of the development. Uh, because when a new house is built, the people move in, they drive cars, they drive over our streets, it increases congestion, traffic is bad. And so this is sort of an equitable way to pay for those, those impacts. We also start looking at sort of the heart of our community. This is when the, the ASAP Robinson Historic District was formed in 2004. We do an update on our, our growth plan. Uh, we, we go full circle and we start saying we need to build sidewalks in 2005 because we need to promote walkability. Uh, also, one of the really neat things that it's developed at that time is the, the Hendricks Village with the TND overlay or the traditional neighborhood development overlay that occurs out there. We start looking and thinking about how can we protect the old portions of Old Conway. Uh, and so we adopt the Old Conway Overlay District at the time to regulate a lot of com uh, historic development, a lot of the uh, residential uh, areas and protect them. And then we also, by 2007, have adopted development review standards. So again, we apply a lot of intentional uh, moves to make sure that we are improving the quality of our community and make sure that it, it, it is built in the best way possible so that we are leaving a legacy for our children and grandchildren. So looking at these population figures by 2000, Conway's got 43,000 folks. We are blowing everybody out of the water. Uh, we've definitely grown a lot more than Benton and Bryant, and I think you see that uh, one of the keys, like I said previously, was the, the amenity of the community. I think that becomes a very important uh, differentiating factor uh, that makes us attractive. Rogers uh, we is continuing to grow at a rapid pace. You can see that we've uh, got almost 20,000 more people than, than Russellville by this time. Uh, so you can see some changes that have occurred there where we had some of the same sort of ideas and, and position where we were uh, very early on, but uh, the paths of our two communities have uh, sort of gone in different, different not, not directions, but uh, and on different tracks. Uh, and then Blyville continues to uh, see some population loss as well. So these are some sort of examples of development and that, that occurred earlier on and then development that occurs later on. Uh, and this development that you see on the right, uh, the bottom right, that's Long John Silver's, uh, still currently in operation. 
Uh, and one of the things that you see here is that there's a lot of curb cuts. There's not a lot in terms of landscaping. There's a lot of asphalt. The parking's right up against the street. Uh, and those are all things that are sort of an older style of development that we don't do currently today. Uh, that is juxtaposed against the Chick-fil-A that's at, at Print Street, and you see all of the landscaping, the beautiful landscaping, the parking is tucked back and away, it's buffered, the sign is down low towards the street. Those are all very intentional moves uh, and, and, and are a result of the regulations that were passed to increase the quality of development and increase the aesthetic uh, value of our community. Uh, those were very important progressive things that were, were done at that time. Another example um, is uh, there's some, here's some development that occurred in, in sort of the older part of Conway. Uh, and this is not shown in any way, shape, form, or fashion to demean any form of, of multifamily development or, or duplex development. Uh, multifamily development, duplex development plays an important role within our community. Uh, we are a college town, and so that, that, that is important for students to move here. It's also important for folks to have flexibility and have rental options. Uh, and so it's, there's nothing wrong with, the, with that style of development, but it is important to think about the form. And I think the form of development relates to uh, sort of the, the quality of it. And so we start to see sort of an older style that maybe isn't necessarily viewed as a, as a tremendous asset within a community because it's not as aesthetically pleasing. Uh, it doesn't invite reinvestment over time, whereas that's juxtaposed to some of the newer development that we had in Hendricks Village, where you've got a mix of single family, uh, duplex, townhouses, multifamily that all occurs, uh, that has a high amenity uh, that looks very visually appealing. Uh, and preserves its value very well over time. Uh, and so th those are some of sort of the differences in terms of our development. Uh, the 2000s, some of the history with that is we start to see new growth areas. Uh, things happen along Dave Ward Drive, as you see in that example there with the, the Centerstone development on there. Prince Street starts to develop as well. Uh, Salem Road starts to see some nodes of, of commercial development in Donaghy, the north end of Donaghy and the south end of Donaghy as well. Uh, those start to be the, sort of the new growth areas. And one of the things that happens whenever you have new growth areas within any, any uh, community is you start to see some of your legacy corridors start to decline. And so in this 2000s period, we see Hark Rider uh, not, uh, starts to not look as visually appealing as it used to. Oak Street uh, starts to look not necessarily as visually appealing. It doesn't necessarily, what I would say, represent... Um, the best of what Conway is. Uh, we are a very beautiful community, and so for a lot of folks driving down those two corridors, they represent uh, Conway for outside visitors. Uh, and so they don't necessarily represent the best. One of the great things the city's currently working on, uh, or, or, or uh, have a plan for Oak Street called the Oak Street Ahead uh, plan, uh, that is really a sort of a integrated land use and transportation development plan for the redevelopment of Oak Street that we think uh, it will be really critical to helping address this particular issue. So then we go to the, the 2010s uh, and you see here on, on population, uh, Conway's gone from 43,000 to 58,000, uh, still larger than Rogers at that period. Uh, you can see the comparison to the other communities, but Conway starts to mature. Uh, at this time. We've had a, a lot of outward growth. Uh, we will continue to have outward growth within our community that you see, but we start to have a lot more consideration and a lot more thought about, well, what about the older parts of our community where we need redevelopment? We don't want to have sort of uh, these areas that are, are challenged. And so one of the things in 2003, we sought a grant from uh, Metroplan, a, what they call a jumpstart grant that was sort of an integrated plan uh, code uh, and transportation improvements. Uh, that's, that's what you currently see is the improvement of Markham Street. Uh, that was handled there and it was really a, a plan for the redevelopment of that area. Uh, Markham Street is an important part of our community, uh, part of the, the sort of the black business district historically uh, in Conway, um, but you've seen a lot of uh, demolition of structures in that area, a lot of vacancy. Uh, and so it's a good area for for redevelopment in a sense of 
seeing that there's there's opportunities and it's it's in close proximity of downtown. One of the things that's really important that we want to make sure happens and occurs as this area develops is that we want to make sure that it honors the legacy and history of that community. So that's very important to the city as well. One of the things we also see is downtown overlay uh, restrictions become a, a big thing at this at this period. We want to make sure that as our downtown, we have structures built, we have structures that are modified in downtown. We're very concerned about how they appear and how they look uh, and making sure that they create long-term assets. Um, the folks that develop structures in the 19... 1910s and 1920s and 1930s in our communities, they left us a very strong uh, architectural legacy. That they left us things that we, we really can be proud of in many ways. But we need to make sure that today uh, in, the, in you know, the 21st century that we honor those improvements and we continue to invest in our community in the same uh, way that gives, gives sort of this longevity uh, and, and have buildings that, that will live on beyond all of us as well. So, so here's some images that I think for a lot of Conway residents, it's hard to, hard to imagine and remember some of the differences. On the right, that's an image of, of Oak Street looking towards the west. It's in the same location on the, on the left side there. That's where the Met Express uh, has been developed. And one of the things that we started to look at in this period was, was some redevelopment on Oak Street. We've had little bit, bits and pieces of it that have developed over time. Uh, and one of the things that you see is we really encourage uh, newly is to get rid of some of the parking that's right up front on the street. We want buildings to be built towards the street to be more walkable. We have uh, attractive landscaping that makes it a, a more attractive area to walk through. Uh, and that's some of the sort of the intentional things that I think are important in terms of thinking about how um, we want our head, the city to head in the, in the future. Another great example, uh, it's, it's hard to imagine the old gas station uh, that was there at the, the corner of Oak and Hark Rider and how that's been transformed into the, the CVS pharmacy uh, that's located at the corner. This was a, uh, uh, honestly a very contentious uh, battle uh, for the city in terms, of, in terms of this development. Ultimately, I think it came out with a product that uh, is, is sort of a, a very good win, a very... Uh, important asset for our community as a whole. Um, but one of the things that you see here is that the, the building is built right up to the corner of the street, addresses the street, uh, has a lot of visual interest, uh, and it's a place where you feel comfortable walking by, whereas what it was previously is, is am I going to get hit by a car veering off the road? That, that was often, you know, one of those things or a concern or somebody pulling through. But again, these are sort of these two are examples of this this sort of intentional way and approach to development that we have taken and uh, focused on uh, in the last ten or twenty years to really make sure that we continue to be a, a great community. So, where do we head as a community? Um, that I think is a very important question. By 2020, uh, our census figures, which I don't believe are accurate, um, and there was a lot of challenge with, with uh, conducting that, that census at that time, uh, they say that our population is at 64,000 folks. We think that in the city it's a little bit higher than that. But you see our comparison, um, Rogers has started to grow beyond and, and past us, uh, and you can see the other communities there as well. But one of the questions I, I think in answering this is, you know, over the next 30 years, we'll likely have 90 to 100,000 people. And so I talked about that, that idea of where we have come along over this entire period of growth, uh, where we started from, a, you know, our, our nascent start as this very small community, outward growth, we've matured. And I think one of the things that you see of where we're heading, I think we're, we're going to be adopting a both and approach to development. I think that's where Conway needs to head. And when I say a both and approach, I mean the form of development that has taken us to where we are today, I think will continue to be a going operation. We're going to continue to see single family development. Uh, it probably won't be in the same capacity that you have seen it occur in, in West Conway. I think you're gonna see a lot of it start to occur in East Conway. Uh, those are where a lot of development opportunities uh, are 
uh, available and where uh, I think you've got utilities in place to really make sure that, that that style of development happens. One of the things that's important that we look at in terms of addressing this is we need to make sure that as that new part of East Conway develops, that it develops in a cohesive manner. So that in 30 years, we don't have discussions about West Conway and East Conway. We have discussions about Conway, that we're one community. I think that's very important uh, that we not uh, further any kind of divide that exists or that might be perceived or anything along those lines. We need to really develop in a cohesive manner. Uh, and then also there's that both, but there's also the and uh, related to this where I think it's very important that we start to grow up. Um, and, and the reason I say this is when you transition to a community that has 90 or 100,000 people, there are different types of development, there are different types of amenities, there are different types of things that a community of that size needs. Uh, and so that means that are we going to be a single family only community? No. That means we're going to need multifamily. That means we're going to need townhouses. We're going to need forms of duplex development. We're going to need to densify our downtown. We're going to need to be more walkable so that we can attract the sort of diverse range of the types of folks uh, and make sure that we get sort of folks from all from all spectrums uh, that want to move here and live here. And that's, I think, is going to be really important. So when we talk about projects like there's a, a new uh, apartment complex that's going in on uh, College Avenue that will have about 120 units. Uh, that That's uh, roughly three to four stories tall. Uh, it's on a couple acres of land. And um, I think it's going to be at sort of a high amenity type development. When you think about the math of how we fit 100,000 people, uh, it obviously works much easier in that type of situation. And it allows us to help preserve a lot of our natural environment. So I think that's one of the things that you'll see as an example of that, that we start to see some level of densification. It's natural that happens within, within every community in every city. But one thing I want to leave you all with is to challenge you to think about, well, in 30 years, uh, you know, my job and my responsibility is, is to plan, uh, help plan the city. Uh, but really, as one individual, I, it is, I, I am not the one that it's really should be representing the vision, right? It should be the vision of the entirety of our community. So I would, I would take that question and I would flip it and, and say to everybody out there that, that's listening, what do you want our community to be like in 20 or 30 years when we reach 90 or 100,000 people? What are the things that we all need to invest in? What are the types of amenities that we need? Uh, what do you think our, our, our vision should be? I think there's sort of a, a direction that we're heading, but it's a challenge because I, all of us, all of us have a role in planning our community. It belongs to all of us. It's our shared legacy. It's our shared history. It's our shared future and we need to all be invested in it. So I hope this presentation has given you some insight on the history of Conway, and more importantly, on where we're heading in the future. Uh, if you have any questions for us at the planning department, feel free to reach out to us. Our website is uh, conwayarkansas.gov. Uh, you can go to the planning and development page, give us a call, drop us an email, uh, anything. We love to interact with the public and, and you know, answer questions. Uh, we, we really enjoy it. So thank you for watching.